We're going to begin in verse 3, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. Of course, these are the words of Jesus, and I believe that this is the greatest teaching that has ever been given in history on what it means to be a Christian. Jesus would say, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and, say, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And I want to take our subject matter this morning from verses 7 eight, and nine. And I want us to title this subject, this message today, Those Who Live for God. When you live for God, certain things should be characteristic of the child of God. When you live for God, people should not have to question who you are and what you are. I want to say that again. If you live for God, people should not have to question if you are a, a Christian or not. They should know it by what they see. And that's what I want to talk about here this morning, those who live for God. And I know that some of you may think it's a little strange to have a subject matter like that when you're dealing with the Beatitudes. But You'll find out and you'll see it clearly as we get through this message today. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We ask that once again that you would anoint us today to teach, to minister your word. Anoint our ears to hear what you would have us to say. And we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I want to share a humorous story it has really nothing to do with our text, but in a sense, it has something to do with our text. It had to have been about 18 years ago. Jill and I had just gotten married. Samantha was not yet born, so it had to be in that time frame. As you know, as Dad mentioned, I am a huge Dallas Cowboy fan. I got my Dallas Cowboy colors on today. How about them Cowboys? And I don't care what anybody says, if we paid somebody off or not, a win is a win. <laughs> this happened about 18 years ago, and the Cowboys were playing the Detroit Lions. Both teams were bad. Detroit was worse. Detroit had won one game all season long. One. They were the worst team in the NFL. Dallas was not that much better. Our quarterback excelled in one thing, and that was smoking weed. Not kidding. He was suspended for smoking weed a few games. During the course of that game, we were playing in old Cowboy Stadium. And the Detroit Lions were whooping us back and forth, front and back, up and down the field. It was a bad, bad day at Black Rock, so to speak. And the announcer just kind of happened to say in kind of a, I don't know what you would call it, it was kind of a shock. And he said, you know, it's hard to believe that the Detroit Lions have won one game all year long. It wasn't five minutes after that guy said that. He calls me on the phone 
and he's rolling on the ground, literally wheezing and laughing and could not catch his breath. And all of a sudden, he said, they've won one game all year and hung up the phone. He's laughing. I'm stewing. I had to walk outside just to get some fresh air. Every year for 18 years, at some point, he will call me. And he will say, they've won one game all year and hang up the phone. And it still makes me, it irritates me. Because here's the thing. The scripture says, show mercy. He was not showing mercy to me. Not showing mercy to me at all. Oh, I have to set him straight after church this morning. I'm kidding. Now, I want to ask you something. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a question that I'm going to need some audience participation. So can y'all do that for me right now? Can y'all help me? Somebody said, yes, sir. My Lord, I'm not that old. All right. I want to ask you a question, and I want you to answer. Most of you should know this answer. What is the most important factor when it comes to understanding how to live for God. What's the most important thing? Faith. Faith. Yeah, good job on that one. Faith. Faith. Understand. Faith is the most important thing to know when it comes to living for God. But we need to take this one step further. What must be our correct object of faith? The finished work of Christ. If our faith is anchored in what Jesus Christ has done correctly, then you're going to know what it is to walk and to live for God. You see, the scripture places a preeminence on being and not doing. I'm going to say that one more time so you can get that. The scripture, the word of God, places a preeminence on being over doing. However, Unfortunately, I believe it's sad to say that Western Christianity has reversed this. They place a preeminence on doing over being. When you ask somebody, are you saved? More than likely, you might hear this response. Well, I attend such and such church. And I even volunteer in one of the ministries. We have a lot of people that attend churches all over the country. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they are a Christian. We've got scores who volunteer for ministries in churches. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they are a Christian. So we have to understand that modern Christianity places an emphasis on doing over being. When the scripture has it reversed, you place an emphasis on being over doing. It is not because I do these things, well, that must make me a Christian. No. I am a Christian, therefore I do these things. Come on now. I'm going to do that. I'm going to say that just one more time. I'm repeating myself because I really want you to get this. It's not what you do that makes you a Christian. It's not what you do that makes you a Christian. It's what you believe that makes you a Christian. 
And if your faith is in Jesus Christ alone, who he is and what he's done, then your faith will influence what you do. You see, when you have it flipped, you put the emphasis on doing over being, then those individuals will say that, well, in essence, they control their faith. They control their Christianity, meaning this, well, I am a Christian, but I don't really believe such and such in the Bible. Oh, I I believe in Jesus, but I don't really believe that marriage really should be between one man and one woman. You know, they say love is love. You can just, you can't help who you love. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit inside of you will help you with that. So here's the thing. It is not you that is supposed to control your faith or your Christianity. You are to let your faith control you. When your faith is anchored correctly in Jesus Christ and what he did at Calvary, the Holy Spirit is going to work inside of you and the Holy Spirit is going to lead you. He's going to guide you. He's going to direct you. He's going to instruct you. He's going to inform you. He's going to convict you. He's going to pour out blessings upon you. In other words, whenever you're truly born again and you understand how to live for God, then guess what? The Spirit of God's going to control everything about you you and that's the way it should be we should not control you see we've seen, you remember you've seen all those license plates that uh, you can buy at you know the grocery stores or the, the whatever you call them it says Jesus is my co-pilot that's somebody that's trying to control their faith Jesus is not your co-pilot he is your pilot He is the one guiding you and leading you and directing you. With that, you're allowing your faith to control you. But also, as you continue to learn about who Jesus is and what he's done for you, The Holy Spirit is still working within you. It is a lifelong process. It's not an overnight thing. It is lifelong each and every single day where the Spirit of God's working in you, moving on you. It's some days it's one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back. But either that, regardless of that, if you don't quit believing, the Spirit of God's going to help you get over whatever it is that you're struggling with. But at the same time, As you continue to grow, you should see things change within you. And here's one of the biggest things that should change. It is your actions. Once again, I am a Christian, therefore I is not the opposite. When you understand who you are in Christ, you understand your faith being anchored in Jesus Christ, who he is, the Spirit of God is going to work, and you're going to start seeing some characteristics develop in your life. And thank God for that. Thank God for that. And there's one characteristic that should be developed within every single child of God. And it's found in this seventh verse. Blessed are the merciful. How is that a characteristic? How is that a trait? Because you within and of yourself are not merciful. That is something that is developed by the Holy Spirit that as you continue to grow in knowledge and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, these characteristics should start working and operating, and one of them is extending mercy. What is mercy? 
Grace and mercy are synonymous. They're one, they're not the same. They're different, but they go one with the other. Many times where you find grace, you'll find mercy. We sing that old chorus, your grace and mercy brought me through. I'm living each moment because of you. I want to thank you and praise you too for your grace and mercy brought me through. (laughs) My Lord, I want to say that again. Your grace and mercy brought me through. I'm living this moment because of you. I want to praise you and thank you too for your grace and mercy has brought me through. Thank God that his grace and mercy is bringing us through each and every single trial and tribulation. My Lord, I feel that this morning. His grace and mercy will never let you down. His grace and mercy will never let you down. He'll never overlook you, but it will always bring you through every trial and tribulation in life. Glory to God. Your grace and mercy brought me through. I'm living this moment because of you. I want to thank you. Come on, church. Why don't you stand to your feet here this morning? Just lift up your hands and say, Lord, I thank you for what you've done for me. I thank you for bringing me through. I thank you for the blood of Jesus that washes and cleanses from every stain. I want to thank you and praise you too for his grace and mercy. It brought me through. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Come on, somebody just worship him in this place. Somebody praise him in this place this morning. Lord, we love you today. Lord, we worship you right now. We praise your holy name. We thank you for all that you have done for each and every single one of us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for bringing us through every trial, every heartache, every downtime. Lord, we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that washes and cleanses from every stain. Glory to God. Come on, speak your praises to him, church. Just take a moment and just thank him. Just take a moment and worship him. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. If I could have just one of our singers just for a moment, it won't take but just a second. This is an opportunity for us to say, Lord, you brought us through 2023. You brought us through our difficult times. You brought us through losing family members and friends. You brought us through difficult circumstances. But your grace and mercy has brought me through. Your grace and mercy. Could you just sing that, Brian, please? That chorus. Your grace and mercy. Your grace and mercy. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Thank you, Jesus. In the Second verse, please, Brian. Justice demanded. Lord, justice demanded that I oh, should yes. die. But grace and mercy. But grace and mercy say we've already. Say, oh, no. We've already paid. Lord, I once, once was blind. I once was blind. 
yes I was But thank God Now I can see Oh yes Cause your grace and oh, mercy yes, your grace and mercy My Lord came Came down and rescued me Come on church one time let's sing it now Your grace and mercy Yes your grace and mercy mercy thank you singers thank you musicians that's mercy mercy well, you know what grace is grace is the goodness of God you may be seated the goodness of God given to undeserving people but mercy says this and this is the way the best way that I could think of it, it, it makes it real to me mercy is compassion with action it's compassion with action it's the ability to use judgment on a person who deserves it. But instead of enlisting judgment, you show compassion with the action of doing something to alleviate the suffering. One of the greatest examples of mercy found in Scripture it's a story that all of you know. If you have been in church for any number of years, you've heard this. The parable of the Good Samaritan. That's one of the greatest examples of compassion, of mercy that's found in Scripture. You see, a man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and on his route... A band of thugs, of thieves, of robbers descended upon him, beat him, bloodied him, stole everything from him, and left him for dead. You have the priest and a Levite, the religious aristocracy of that day, and both of them, who were the ones who should have shown mercy, walked right past and ignored him. But Jesus would say that there was a Samaritan, one who was not exactly looked upon too kindly by the Jewish people of that day. They were looked down upon. They were treated awful and unkind. And yet here was this Samaritan who saw this Jewish man beaten and bloodied and battered and left for dead. And in his mercy, he could have just looked at him and said, you deserve this because of how you treat my people. But instead of that, Jesus said that he knelt down. He began to clean him up as best as he could. He picked him up and placed him on his donkey, if that's what he was using. Led him to an inn where he began to bandage his wounds, take care of him, even to the point of going to the innkeeper and after paying the debt for that room, said, if there's anything that is left owed, next time I come, I will pay it back to you. Church, here's what you need to understand. 
God never once withheld mercy from us. Amen. Even when we did not deserve it. Especially when we deserved judgment. That second verse, judgment or justice demanded that I should die. But his grace and mercy said, no, no. I've already paid the price. I've already paid the price. You see, mercy doesn't see color. Oh, come on now. Mercy doesn't see color. Mercy doesn't see your social status or your lack of social status. Mercy does not even see your religion. Come on now. Mercy says, irregardless of what you are, of who you are, as a Christian, you say, as God has extended mercy to me untold times, it is my responsibility as a child of God to extend that same mercy. That's not easy to do. Especially when somebody has hurt you. Especially when someone has done something to you. Especially when someone has slandered you in such a way that it has left you with nothing but anger and bitterness towards that person. But you have to think one of the greatest characteristics of a Christian is understanding that when I didn't deserve it, when I was at my lowest, God looked down on me and extended grace and mercy to me. Therefore, I must extend mercy to those in need. Let's take this just a little bit deeper. And even though we will deal with this subject matter a little later, I feel, I feel it's apropos that we deal with it now. And it's this. Don't answer this question aloud. Don't raise a hand. This is something that I want you to look deep inside of your own heart. I want to ask you this question. Are you harboring unforgiveness towards someone else? Are you harboring unforgiveness towards a parent, a son or daughter, a loved one, a neighbor? fellow Christian Gabe you're telling me that even though this person has done these things to me that even though I've got to extend mercy I also have to extend forgiveness yes mercy and forgiveness is some of the hardest things to give but you don't know what they've done to me You don't know the heartache, the pain, the suffering that this person has inflicted upon me. You don't realize the turmoil that I have lived in because of this person. No, I may not. I may not understand that. But as a child of God, you need to also think, just as God has extended mercy to me, how many times that God has extended forgiveness to you? How many times have you blown it? How many times have I blown it? Messed up royally. Made a fool of myself. 
shamed the name of Jesus. And yet if I come to him with a broken and contrite spirit, thank God he doesn't look at me and say, you've embarrassed me, Gabriel. It's too, it's too, it's too late. You're done. I will never forgive you because of that. Thank God that even when I, I was at my worst and made a mistake and failed the Lord, as we sang, when I failed him, he didn't fail me and he picked me up. And when I asked for forgiveness, he was right there to extend that hand of forgiveness. We need to consider that. That if God did not neglect us, and if God did not refuse mercy and forgiveness to us, who are we to withhold mercy and forgiveness to someone else? It's one of the hardest things to do is to tell someone that hurts you, I forgive you. But I want to share a story with you today. A personal story. I was very close to an individual, I won't call his name, very close. I looked up to him. I looked at him as a mentor, as a friend, a person that was probably closer to me than anyone else. Events took place. Things happened. Words were exchanged. And a friendship that was years that had taken years to cultivate, to build, to strengthen, was torn down in just a matter of days. I was heartbroken. I struggled in my mind to make sense of it. How could this happen? Why did this happen? And I wasn't careful enough because I allowed bitterness to start to take root. To the point when his name ever came up, I would get angry. And I would start to think about all the things that happened. The things that he said. Several years went by. A guy that I met because of this individual called me and said, I'm coming to Baton Rouge. I want to hang out with you. I said, sure, absolutely. I'm coming to church Sunday night. I'd like to hang out with you right after. Perfect. Let's go to lunch or to dinner. We went to a restaurant right down the road. Had a good time, but you can tell it was awkward. We got back in the vehicle, and I was bringing him back here to the church, and he said, Oh, I, I forgot to tell you. I didn't drive here. I looked at him and I said, you didn't? No. Well, where do I need to take you? I need to take, you need to take me to that person's house. And I said, I would just assume just drop you off on the side of the road and let you walk. <laughs> and I was like... What am I going to do? I think he did it on purpose. But more importantly, I think God orchestrated it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. I bring him, pull him up in the driveway, and he gets out. I let him get out, and I take off. And it wasn't two seconds after I started driving that the Lord says, stop your car, turn around, go inside and talk to him. And I said, absolutely not. Have you ever had an argument with God? Like he doesn't know what he's doing? God, do you know what he did to me? 
Second time, st- stop your car, turn around, go inside and talk to him. Third time, I said, absolutely, I slammed my hands against the steering wheel. I said, that'll never happen. But the third time, the voice was so strong that I immediately slammed my brakes. He said, Gabriel, go inside and talk to him. This happened in the space of 30 seconds to a minute, and I'm backing up. And the funny thing is, is that the friend that I dropped off had not gone inside. He was standing on the curb. Standing. And I pulled back and rolled down the window and I called him by his name. I said, it's so-and-so inside. This individual had gone through some problems himself. And he said, he is. I said, do you think he'll let me come inside and talk to him? He said, I don't know. And it wasn't five seconds, he comes walking out. Our friend walks in and he's standing there. He wouldn't look me in the eye. You know something? It it took a lot in me to not want to lash out at him in revenge and say, I can't believe you did this, you said this, why did you do this? And all these emotions were starting to fill up in my soul, in my body in my being and I wanted to just lash out and say all these things to him but instead I looked at him and I just said I just want to let you know I'm praying for you and I love you that was it he didn't say anything in return I got in the car and I'm questioning this the whole way home why did you God why did you want me to do that That's not the end of the story. Thirteen years have passed, something like that. Somehow we, we wound up in the same place at the same time. And the moment that happened, I just, once again, just stiffened up and just... He walked up to me and he just said, look, do you think we need to meet for lunch one day? And I said, yeah, sure. We met a few days later. We went once again to one of these restaurants right up here by the ministry. We sat down and exchanged pleasantries. How's the family? How are the kids? You have to understand a lot, of, a lot of bad blood was there. A lot of bad blood. But he looked up at me and all of a sudden tears started running down his cheeks. And he said, Gabe, I just want to tell you, I'm sorry. God has been dealing with me. And I need to tell you, I'm sorry for what happened and how I treated and what I said and what I did. I'm asking you to forgive me. And it was at that moment, that event that happened 16, 17 years ago came back to my mind. It took that long. Sometimes these processes are not easy, but God has a timing for everything. And as I sat there, I, tears started welling up in my, in my eyes and started running down my cheek. And I just told him, I'm sorry too. In the moment that happened, I can't tell you. The only thing I felt, it was like a weight lifted off of my shoulders. Because here's the thing. Understand this, church. When you extend forgiveness, when you extend forgiveness, you are placing them into the hands of God. You are releasing them to the Lord, and that burden is lifted off of you. Because here's the thing, forgiveness can kill you, or unforgiveness can kill you. Forgiveness can set you free. I want to say that one more time. Unforgiveness can kill you. It can weigh you down. But forgiveness can eliminate that, can cast off those chains 
and it can relieve you and release you from that bondage of hatred and bitterness and unforgiveness. Because here's the thing, the scripture says when you show mercy, mercy finds you. When you extend forgiveness, forgiveness finds you. Because here's the thing, as a child of God, we need to all take inventory and realize we should have been gone a long time ago. We should have been judged a long time ago. But his mercy and his forgiveness has changed our life. So I want to ask this question again. If God has extended mercy to me and forgiveness to me, who am I to withhold that from someone else? I'm not going to go any further. I'll finish the rest next time. But if there's any unforgiveness in your heart towards someone, then you need to go to that person and ask them to forgive, or say, I forgive you. And if you are harboring ill will towards someone, then you need to go to that person and ask for forgiveness. It's the hardest thing to do. But when you do that, it releases you and releases them into the hands of God. Do not, do not walk through life holding grudges. Do not walk through life holding unforgiveness in your heart. This is your time to say, God, it's a new year. It's a new me. I'm not going to go through this new year with harboring unforgiveness in my heart. And it's up to you to extend forgiveness and mercy to those who even do not deserve it. How do I know? Let me give you this story before I close. The greatest story of unforgiveness or for forgiveness found in Scripture is when Jesus was on Calvary. Hanging upon a cross. He had suffered. He had been beaten. His beard yanked from his face. Spat upon back ripped to shreds. Crown of thorns placed upon his brow to add insult to injury, nailed to an old rugged cross. And they told him, if you be the Messiah, if you be the Christ, come down. He could have, with a command, one command he could have called for legions of angels to destroy these people I honestly believe that with one word every one of those people could have been obliterated destroyed killed dropped dead right there on the spot he had the power to do it but instead he uttered ten words father Forgive them, for they know not what they do. As a child of God, we need to understand God has forgiven me of so much. He's shown me so much mercy. that I need to act like Christ and show forgiveness and mercy when needed. It's up to you. Your call to action today is very simple. If there is unforgiveness in your heart towards someone, you need to ask them to forgive you. 
If someone has hurt you, you need to say, I forgive you. And watch the Lord go to work. Am I saying y'all got to be best friends? No, no, no. Not at all. But what I am saying, when you show forgiveness, you'll find it. When you show mercy, you'll find it. Would you stand, please? Father, as we come before you today, as we close the year of 2023, we ask, Lord, that these humble words would resonate in the hearts of your people. And I'm asking right now, Lord, that you would deal with your people. If there's any hurt, unforgiveness, in the heart of your people that we may deal with it and ask that person to forgive us and ask you to forgive us for harboring ill will towards someone else. Strengthen us to do this, Lord. We know it's not easy, but you will give us the grace to see it through. And I pray blessings upon your people here today that as we end this year of 2023 and then we begin a brand new year in the morning that your grace and mercy will continue to bring us through that your grace and mercy will continue to bring us through this new year and we ask it all in the name of Jesus I'm going to ask them to sing that chorus one more time just for a moment before we dismiss would you please just come down to this front this evening or this morning and let's just lay, raise our hands toward heaven and let's just begin to thank the Lord for everything just that course one more time Brian please your grace and mercy this front please this morning and I
Yes, you're 